UN peace. Let me stop there for a second. Grace to you and peace. That's how I began all of my sermons. And if you've been here at Christ Lutheran Church as long as I have and heard all of my sermons, you will have heard those words over a thousand times. I didn't make them up. They come from the Bible. They come specifically from St. Paul. And that's how Paul begins ten of his 12 letters in the New Testament, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We talk a lot about grace in this congregation, but how are you doing with the peace part of it? Everybody seems to want more peace. World leaders sitting across the table from other world leaders what about peace? People in business dealing with the stress and the pressure of making it every day and every week, they want peace. Homemakers who have to corral kids, they want peace. Students trying to make it through another semester, they want peace. Everybody wants peace. And if we're honest with ourselves, for as much as we want peace, the reality is we probably experience more stress than we do peace. Upon the birth of her fifth child, a mother received um, a playpen as a uh, shower gift, and so she wrote a thank you note to the person who gave the playpen. She wrote, um, thanks for the playpen, I sent it up every afternoon, and from one o'clock until two o'clock, I get in it. The kids can't get to me. <laughs> thanks a bunch. Wouldn't you agree? That peace is one of those things we talk a lot about and we want more of, but we have less of. It seems to be pretty universal. Our days are like the days of the prophet Jeremiah, when the people said, peace, peace, but there was no peace. Americans live in comfortable homes, and yet domestic violence is at an all-time high. Our cities are some of the most modern cities in the world, and yet our streets aren't safe at night. Our communication technology is unsurpassed, and yet people live with seemingly more and more misinformation or misunderstanding. In fact, people come to church so stressed out, so much anxiety, that it's almost impossible for a sermon to put them to sleep. <laughs> but I do my best. <laughs> a study was done among some historians from uh, Egypt and England, Germany, and India. Fascinating study. And they looked at them, all of recorded history, and they went back to the year 3600 BC. So that's over 5,500 years, and they determined that in that period of time, there's only been 292 years of peace, that there's been 14,300 wars, of whether small or large in size, where 3.6 billion people have been killed. They discovered that um, over this period of time, there have been 8,000 peace treaties made and 8,000 peace treaties broken. We are anything but peaceful people. I have to imagine that the disciples got frustrated with Jesus on occasion. And the reading that we just heard a few moments ago from the Gospel of John might be one of those moments. This comes at a really particularly critical time. It's a Thursday. It's the day before Jesus is to be excommunicated, or he's going to be put on the cross and crucified. And yet he says to his disciples these two things. One, A, he's leaving. Two, they can't follow. And then he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And I have to believe that um, their reaction was the equivalent of first century thought of, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? Give me a break. Or maybe that's just my 21st century reaction. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Are you kidding? Look around. 
political bickering left and right, people fighting over water use, a seeming endless war taking place in the Middle East and spilling over into the United States. Churches, churches in conflict, just about everywhere you look. People arguing over immigration and health care and sexual ethics, oil spills, bombs going off in Brussels and mass shootings in San Bernardino and we're not supposed to be troubled. This is what makes Jesus' promise of peace so very difficult to understand. Peace seems just to be that one thing that we're missing the most right now. Peace, after all, would mean the cessation of conflict, right? The end of turmoil, the conclusion of the things that cause us to worry or to want or to wait, right? But I wonder. I mean, I usually think of peace as the absence of something negative, the absence of war, the absence of strife, the absence of, of fear or anger. And indeed, that's the, the first definition that you would come across if you were to Google it or look it up in an old-fashioned book. Peace. Freedom from disturbance. But it occurs to me in reading and rereading these words of Jesus to his disciples. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe peace isn't the taking away of something, maybe it's the addition of something. Maybe peace is creating something positive in the face of a negative. Making something wonderfully possible where prior to that it was devastating or destructive. Maybe, maybe it's the addition of Jesus himself. I think this is what Jesus is referring to. I think he's pointing a finger at himself when he says, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Jesus is, after all, borrowing very heavily upon the Old Testament understanding of peace. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace, as you probably know, is shalom. The connotation is a positive sense. When someone says shalom, or peace be with you, what they're not saying is, I hope that there's an absence of trouble in your life. No, what they're saying is, I hope you have more. I hope you have more of God. I hope you have more of God's presence. I hope you have more of God's love. I hope you have more of God's joy. I hope you have more of God's mercy. There was a sense that having more of God is the only way to live one's life. And Jesus comes along and simply places himself now at the center. You need to have more of Jesus. So the biblical concept of, of peace isn't the absence of trouble. Biblical peace has nothing to do with external circumstances. It's what takes place on the inside. You may be going through the greatest trials or tribulations of your life, and yet you might have peace. The Apostle Paul teaches us how deep and important this sense of peace is as he tells us about his life. He's had external circumstances take place in his life repeatedly. Imprisonments over and over, countless floggings. Five times he's received 40 lashings. Three times he's been beaten with rods. Once he received a stoning. He's been shipwrecked. He's been in danger wherever he has gone. Sleepless nights, hungry, thirsty, cold, and naked. And yet, he says, may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. Who doesn't want that? Peace does not ex depend on our external circumstances. You know what that makes me think about? Let me tell you why I am not an NBA star, nor ever could be. Aside from the fact that I'm a little over six foot, and I have a vertical leap of about two and a half inches, <laughs> the real reason I'm not an NBA star is I get easily distracted. Have you ever watched Steph Curry play basketball for the Golden State Warriors? That guy is phenomenal. The crowds might be going crazy. The clock might be ticking down to the final seconds. The coach might be yelling directions. 
He might have two, maybe three defenders on him. And yet, so calmly, so focused, he takes that ball, he maneuvers to center court, a couple head fakes, puts up a 30-footer, and swish, wins the game. That's what I think about when I think about God's peace. Not dependent on external circumstances, but it's here. It's well deep inside, the kind of peace that only comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a matter of the heart, or more specifically, a matter of the soul. It goes deep, and it runs deep. So if that's so, if I'm willing to rethink what I have thought about peace, then maybe, maybe I need to rethink what I have thought about faith. Because I suspect that there are a couple of ways that people can approach faith. Both approach from the perspective that this world is a troubled world, that there are problems, that there are stresses, and that there are conflicts always happening. But one side of faith often says that once you come to faith, those problems go away. Those issues no longer have any power. The, the, the problems of life simply get resolved because of faith. And if it's not, then you haven't had enough faith. You need more. I've had people tell me stuff like, all you need is Jesus in your heart and everything's going to be okay. The other view of faith, however, doesn't promise an end to the problems, to the tremors of life. What it does promise, however, is a sure footing in order to deal with those issues. Faith, when taken from this perspective, simply suggests that there's no removal of problems in life, but it only allows problems to be dealt with and become bearable. Faith doesn't take away the, the difficult times of life, but it keeps them from dominating us. It keeps from defining who we are. We are more than what's missing in our life. We are, as St. Paul and St. John, who wrote Revelation, says we are, new creations. Faith makes this possible. Faith understood not as some sort of divine plug that fills the hole, that causes all the problems, no, but faith that gives us a new identity, that helps us understand the summons that God has given us to love more, to live more, to be more, and to trust God more than we ever have before. Maybe from this perspective, what it means to be a new creation, to be one who follows this Christ with Christ within us, we become peacemakers. Do you remember what Jesus said about peacemakers? Blessed are the peacemakers. For what? They will be children of God. Do you know any peacemakers? I bet you do. And I bet from time to time, you are a peacemaker. I've been thinking a lot about peacemakers and what does it mean to be a peacemaker. And I went back to some uh, confirmation curriculum that we used to teach the kids years ago, written by a pastor up in Washington by the name of Ed Marquardt, fascinating guy, brilliant individual. And he wrote this one section for confirmation on peacemaking. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Let me share with you what he said. First of all, he says, in order to be a peacemaker, you've got to have the Spirit of God in you. That simply probably goes without saying, doesn't it? But it always begins on the inside. It's always a relationship that we have with God, not dependent on the things taking place on the outside. There really is no peace in life without God as a part of it. We have to know that we have peace with God in order to be able to bring peace of God to others. Secondly, he says a, a peacemaker is somebody who's gentle. Kindness, being calm, those are great hallmarks for a peacemaker. That's so very important because oftentimes, don't we, we fight fire with fire. When things get heated up, we get heated up and we know that in, in reality it never helps conflict when you have two very hot exchanges taking place. But the spirit of gentleness and kindness has a tendency to soften the heat and to reduce the conflict. Third thing that Pastor Marquardt says is that a peaceful person is a person who is deeply concerned about fairness and justice. Fairness and justice. So often conflicts revolve around people, countries, companies, families, where there is very little fairness, very little justice. It's sort of like 
in my marriage relationship, but my wife thought that she was doing all the work and I was sitting in the easy chair having the time of my life, she might point out, this isn't fair. The fairness and justice issue of life is deeply critical as we seek to be people who live out shalom with one another. Fourth, a peaceful person has an awareness of their own sin, their own proclivity to messing things up and being a part of the problem. Oftentimes, we point fingers at other people. I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've heard individuals speak about their ex-spouses in a, in a broken marriage and they simply place all the blame upon that other individual. But a person who is of peace comes to grips with their own culpability, their own responsibilities, and the things that they have done who have silently contributed to the conflict. Fourth or fifth, a peacemaker is tolerant. Even accepting another person's point of view for as difficult as that might be. I think here about that, um, that wise parent of a 16-year-old who wants to have their tongue pierced. Now, most parents might be a little troubled if their kid said they wanted to have their tongue pierced, but a wise parent might be one who listens and tries to understand and responds supportively and lovingly and then locks that child in the attic until the time. <laughs> to gain that perspective, though, is that is to try to live within that person's skin, if just for a moment, to understand their point of view, and to try to understand the happenings of the heart. Gosh, in a world full of war and, and stress and injustice, we need more peacemakers. That's who you are. That's what God has called you to be. That's who you become when you have this relationship with the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So may the peace of Jesus enable you to remain calm in the midst of the most fearful circumstances. May the peace of Jesus help you to hush a cry. May the peace of Jesus help you to still a riot. May the peace of Jesus give you voice to speak for the voiceless. May the peace of Jesus grant you to sing in the middle of suffering. Grace to you and peace. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we share the peace of Christ which is significant as we share this peace to simply know that we are inviting another person to experience more of God, more of Jesus, more peace, more joy, more focus, more love, more mercy. Shalom. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Share that peace with one another.